Start reading in verse 4. Luke chapter 23 and verse 4, the Bible says, Then said Pilate to the chief priests and to the people, I find no fault in this man. And they were the more fierce, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Jewry, beginning from Galilee to this place. And when Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked whether the man were a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged unto Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself also was at Jerusalem at that time. And when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceeding glad, for he was desirous to see him of a long season, because he had heard many things of him, and he hoped to have seen some miracle done by him. Then he questioned with him in many words, but he answered him nothing. And the chief priests and scribes stood and vehemently accused him. And Herod, with his men of war, set him at naught and mocked him, and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe, and sent him again to Pilate. And the same day, Pilate and Herod were made friends together, for before they were at enmity between themselves. Well, in verse 4, we read this last week, Pilate said to the chief priests and to the people, he said to everybody, in other words, that was there, I find no fault in this man. That was important that that be the case about Jesus. He had no faults. Couldn't say that about you or me, because we're all sinners. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Jesus was a man just like we are, except in one point. He never sinned. Wow, what a Savior. He's the only one that led a perfect life. That's one of the values of Jesus coming to the earth. He showed us how to live. A man of prayer. A man who said the truth. A man who loved God and did God's will. A man who loved others. Pilate said to the people, I find no fault in this man. Anybody would have said that had examined Jesus. That would have been their conclusion. I find no fault in this man. Of course, he was wanting to let Jesus go because he knew Jesus was innocent. That was his attempt. We will see many attempts by Pilate to let Jesus go. He's trying to let him go in such a way where everyone agrees. He doesn't want there to be a big controversy. He's a politician. He's trying to get agreement so everyone will be happy with him. And uh, he's not going to do the right thing if everyone's going to be mad at him about it because he's a politician. Then said Pilate to the chief priests and to the people, I find no fault in this man. And they were the more fierce, saying, He stirs up the people, they lied, teaching throughout all Jewry, beginning from Galilee to this place. Oh, they mentioned the word Galilee because Jesus was originally from Galilee. The city of Nazareth was in the region of Galilee. And that's where Jesus first did his preaching, was in that part of Israel. And so when Pilate heard that, verse 6, when Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked whether the man were a Galilean. And of course he was, he's from Nazareth. And as soon as he knew that he belonged unto Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself also was at Jerusalem at that time. Interesting, God arranges all things. Normally, King Herod wasn't at Jerusalem because that wasn't his jurisdiction. Israel was divided into several different ju jurisdictions during the first century. Part of it was ruled by King Herod, Galilee. Part of it was ruled by Pilate, Jerusalem and the surrounding area. That was the Roman jurisdiction where Pilate, the Roman ruler, was there. In the stead of Caesar, he was sent there by Caesar to rule that terrible place. From the Romans' perspective, it was a troublemaking place. You know, you wouldn't like it either, would you? If, you? if a conquering army came in and conquered your country and then sent somebody to rule your country from the other country. And the Jews were very nationalistic, many of them. 
They didn't like the heathen Romans ruling over them. It was a difficult place to rule. One of Pilate's number one jobs was to rule that area without trouble. They didn't want uproar of the people. They didn't want riots and violence. That was his number one requirement when he was sent by the Roman emperor to Jerusalem. Now that's why he's trying to get everybody to agree. Because that's his job, he thinks. And uh, so he's sending him to Herod because this gives him a chance to get somebody else is going to decide what happens to Jesus. Herod will, not me. That's why he sent him there. But Herod, well, he was quite a character. He's the one that killed John the Baptist, had John the Baptist beheaded just three years before this. And uh, so Jesus appears before Herod, wherever he's holding his court in Jerusalem. And when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceeding glad. Why was he glad to see Jesus? For the wrong reason. He wanted to see a miracle. The same reason that some people flock to the television evangelists. They want to see something exciting. They want to see miracles. People said there's miracles take place and they want to see them. It was, you know, the desire to see a sideshow, you might say. For he was desirous to see him of a long season because he had heard many things of him and he hoped to have seen some miracle done by him. Tells us something about the life of Herod. He was, he was the ruler at Galilee. Why didn't he go out to where Jesus was sometime? Jesus was in many different cities. Giant crowds came to hear him. Why didn't Herod go? Well, because he's a king. He stays in court. Autocratic rulers tend to be separate from the people. That's what they're saying about what's going on in Russia right now. You've got a dictator. He doesn't really know what's going on. People say, his advisors say to him what they know he wants to hear. So he doesn't hear the truth. And now he's creating a mess for the whole world. And Herod was like that. He didn't... He had never seen Jesus personally. And think of it, that was the days they had no television or radio, or movies, or videos, or internet. To see a sideshow was really important, and a big draw to them. It's the same reason many people watch television now. A distraction. You know, why aren't they praying more, or reading the Bible more? Well, they'd just rather be mindless watching entertainment. That's what, that's what Herod wanted. Then he questioned with him in many words, but he answered him nothing. Jesus didn't get say one word to King Herod. He knew what Herod was, and he knew where Herod was going. Herod had killed John the Baptist. And Herod, with his men of war, oh, Herod has soldiers too, turns, him over, turns Jesus over to the soldiers, just like Pilate had done, just like the chief priest had done. And it says in verse 11, And Herod with his men of war set him at naught and mocked him. So Herod also mocked Jesus. He's mad. He's mad because Jesus didn't do any miracles and because Jesus didn't answer his questions. And so he's mocking with the soldiers, mocking Christ and probably adding to the tortures. And they arrayed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him again to Pilate. So Jesus, he's already been tried by the chief priests. They want him killed, so they sent him to Pilate. Pilate doesn't want to make a decision, so he sends him to Herod. Herod's angry, doesn't know what to do. After he tortures Jesus, sends him back to Pilate. Fourth time, verse 12. And the same day... Pilate and Herod were made friends together, for before they were at enmity between themselves. And that happens all the time in the world. One thing that unites leaders of the world, their opposition against true Christianity and against Christ. You'll see it a lot. You'll wonder, why are those countries getting together? Why will a communist country get together with a country that allows Muslim terrorists? Why? Because they have one thing in common. They're against the truth. They're against Jesus. 
And Pilate, verse 13, when he had called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people, we're going to try again. He's going to try again. He said to them, You have brought this man unto me as one that perverts the people. That was one of the accusations. Jesus is a troublemaker. That was a lie. He helps people. Behold, I have, ex I have ex examined him before you and have found no fault in this man, touching those things whereof you accuse him. So again, he says, I've done a careful analysis. I've done a fair judgment. Jesus is innocent. No, nor yet hear it, for I sent you to him. And lo, nothing worthy of death is done unto him. So Herod sent him back. He couldn't find anything to condemn him for either. I will therefore chastise him and release him. So he says, I'll just whip him. I'll beat him with the cat of nine tails and let him go. How about that? So he, now he's, I'll just punish him some more, but I won't kill him. No, that's not going to satisfy them. Why is that? You know, just think of Pontius Pilate. He's obviously somewhat truthful. He's not like the chief priests and the scribes wanting to kill Jesus. He's not like Herod looking for a sideshow. But you would think that he could come up with a way to set Jesus free. He's trying really hard. Guess why he can't? I'm going to tell you why. God's in control. Guess what God wants? He wants Jesus to die on the cross. And that's why it's going to happen. Pilate can't let Jesus go. Herod can't let Jesus go. The people can't let him go. And the chief priests can't let him go. Why? Because it's God's will that Jesus die on the cross for our sins. If they had let Jesus go, none of us would go to heaven. Jesus had to die for the sins of the world. Remember that the next time something really bad happens to you? Try to remember it even in you, while you're hurting. It's God's will. He could have stopped it. God's in control. God has a reason. Maybe he's going to fix it later to show how powerful he is. Maybe he's going to use it somehow. He will for his great plan for the world. If Jesus had to suffer this, don't you think we might suffer? He, Jesus said we would. He said the servant's not greater than his Lord. This is what Jesus' life came to, where the wicked took over. Look at the people of Ukraine, what they're suffering now. The wicked are given a free hand right now. It happens in this world because there is a devil and because people are given a free choice and some people choose evil. But God's in control over it. He's going to use it for his glory. There's a purpose to it in God's plan. So you can do one of two things. You can look at things like humans look at it and say, Oh no, woe is me, it's horrible. Or you can look at it the way Jesus did and say, Not my will, but thine be done. And accept God's will. And look at it like we are right now. It's God deciding what would happen. Not these wicked people. Oh well. Okay. They wouldn't do that. For he must release him. Notice verse 17. For of necessity he must release one, of, one unto them at the feast. Evidently the Passover, the great feast in Jerusalem. One of the things the Romans did every Passover, they took one of the prisoners, whoever the people wanted, and they would let him go instead of crucifying him and killing them or keeping them locked up. And they let the people decide. And so Pilate, light bulb goes off. Hey, surely they'll vote for Jesus. Surely they'll choose Jesus. And they cried out all at once, saying, Away with this man, and release unto us Barabbas, who for a certain sedition made in the city, and for murder was cast into prison. 
So the person who actually did the things that Jesus was accused of, sedition, that means a troublemaker in the community, in the, in the province, and in addition, a murderer, they chose him. And that's human nature, my friends. Given a choice between Jesus and the worst that human nature can produce, they reject Jesus. So you want to know what's going on in the world? That very same thing is going on all over the world. And you can go out and talk to people and you'll find out. But they cried, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! Oh, verse 20, I missed that. Pilate, therefore, willing to release Jesus, spoke again to them. So he tried multiple times to get them to let Jesus go, not, not Barabbas. But they cried, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! Remember, these are the same people, probably who cried out just days before when Jesus had entered Jerusalem and what's called the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, Palm Sunday. They cried out, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. But they didn't stay with that, did they? A few days later, things change. The spirit of evil comes over them and they yell out, Crucify him! Crucify him! You know, it's hard to be consistent. Be a consistent Christian. Keep serving the Lord. And he said unto them the third time, Why? What evil has he done? I mean, Pilate's flabbergasted. He cannot believe that they've picked Barabbas instead of Jesus. He can't believe it. I have found no cause of death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. And he's trying over and over again to talk this crowd and these chief priests into letting Jesus go. And it doesn't work. And they were instant with loud voices, so they shout him down. Oh, by the way, this is also a good picture of democracy. Which the ancient Greeks, by the way, studied all the various forms of human government. And some of their philosophers came to the conclusion that democracy was not the best, was not the best means of, of uh, ruling a nation because the crowd <laughs> can do things that you don't really want them to do. What's the crowd? The, mul the, the majority. So, and we're seeing that happen in, in many of the, of the democracies, sadly. And this was, in a way, a, a democratic trial of Jesus. Pilate was letting the, the majority decide, and they said, kill him. And so in verse 24, he finally realizes he has to relent, because he's not going to risk having an uproar on his watch. He's the Roman ruler, he's supposed to keep the peace. So here's his final decision, and by the way, this is what politicians often do. And that's why they're not helping Ukraine more than they are, by the way. For the very same reason. They think by helping Ukraine, even though that's the right thing to do, it'll create more problems for them and for their peoples. Or they're not doing it. They're going to let every city be bombed until there's not one building standing, even though it's wrong to do that. And it's for the same reason right here. Verse 24. And Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they required. He gave sentence. So he said, here's my decision, the death penalty for Jesus. That was his decision. And he released unto them him that for sedition and murder was cast into prison, whom they had desired. So he, he releases Barabbas right there, and he condemns Jesus to death. But he delivered Jesus to their will. And that was God's will. That was God's will, by the way. It's interesting when you think about the plan of God and the power of God. God uses all people. He uses the weaknesses and the failures of people. 
the sins of people to accomplish his will. I don't know how he does it, but he's so powerful that he can even take the free will of man who does bad decisions and make it turn into the will of God. I don't know how he does it, but he does it. Here's a good example, though. Wicked men took Jesus and sent him to the cross, but it was the will of God to die for my sins and for yours. And as they led him away, they laid hold upon one Simon. By the way, he didn't get any appeals. He went right from that courtroom, right to the cross. No appeals. Didn't even wait till the next day. He killed immediately. And on him they laid the cross that he might bear it to Jesus on Simon, a Cyrenian. So someone else carried the cross for Jesus because he was beaten so badly he couldn't carry it. Verse 27, the Bible says, And there followed him a great company of people and of women, which also bewailed and lamented him. So now there's a huge crowd following Jesus on that road out of Jerusalem because he was crucified outside of the city out to the place of crucifixion. A great crowd. And now the ones, the believers are showing up. Evidently they stayed away. Just like the apostles ran away. But Jesus turning unto them said, interesting to me, he's beat almost to a pulp. He can't even carry his own cross even though he's a tremendously powerful man, naturally. And He's going to die. He's going to be nailed to the cross in a matter of minutes, probably. And he's teaching. He turns to these women and he teaches. That's what he is up to the end. And he says to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. Well, no, don't weep for him because it's not really a bad thing that's happening to him from the perspective of God's great plan for humanity. He's going to die for the sins of the world so everyone can go to heaven that chooses to believe. Weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. Now, here's an interesting teaching of Jesus. One of the greatest sufferings of life is what can happen to mothers, to their children, their children. Uh, if you're alive in certain generations, you're going to suffer terribly if you have children. That's what he's saying. For behold, the days are coming in the which they shall say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bear and the paps which never gave suck. So it's a, you're going to be blessed if you don't have children, if you're in this circumstance. And here it is. Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, fall on us and to the hills, cover us. It's going to be so bad for mothers that have little children because there's great sufferings coming on the world. Great sufferings. And he knows one is the destruction of Jerusalem itself. 37 years after Jesus was crucified, it's a historical fact. The Roman army, they couldn't take it anymore. You know, the Pilate trying to keep the peace. Well, they finally realized they can't keep the peace in this crazy Jerusalem. These people hate us too much. We're going we're gonna to level the city. And they did. They leveled Jerusalem and they killed thousands and thousands of Jewish people. Others they scattered. And they would have killed everyone that came in the site, women and children. Jesus knew it was coming. Terrible things happened. Right now in the Ukraine, terrible things are happening. Women and children are being killed. Maternity hospital bombed. I mean, can you get any worse than that? And uh, so he's warning. He's saying, there's some bad things coming to this earth at certain times. And the reason, verse 31, if they do these things, who does them? Human beings. Man sends humanity to man. Jesus saying, I know man sends in humanity to man. Look at what they're doing to me. And if they're going to do this to me, the Son of God, that's what he meant by in a green tree. When, what shall they do in the dry? What are they going to do to normal human beings? They're going to kill even more. 
That's what they're going to do. They're going to torture them and kill them too. The innocent, the children. That's what he's saying. So a warning. A warning from Jesus. Maybe it's a warning to... You better understand what people are really like. They are evil. They will harm. They are people of violence out there. And uh, I wonder if he was thinking of the leader of Russia today. That's what makes me think. Or Hitler. There are people, they don't care who they crush. And they're going to do it. Verse 32 says, now it's going to talk about the crucifixion of Jesus. And there were also two other malefactors led with him to be put to death. Well, Jesus quoted earlier from uh, Isaiah chapter 53. One of the verses says about the Messiah, he was numbered among the malefactors, the criminals led with him to be put to death. So we know that there were three of them were sent to be put to death that day. Jesus and two criminals. And when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. Well, what's that mean they crucified him? They had that big wooden cross laying there. They laid Jesus down on it. They put his hands on the cross. And they put nails through his hands. And then they put a nail through his feet. Attached him to the cross. Now why did the Romans do that? A torture. That wouldn't kill anyone. But they couldn't get off. Once you got your hands and your feet nailed to the cross, you can't get off. Then they took the cross. They would have had a hole dug in the ground. They would have taken the cross and lifted it up and dropped it into the hole. Yanked it. That fall into the hole. And there he is, naked. Naked. Jesus naked on the cross. Crucified there. Now he's powerless. Human beings did what they could to him. And he did nothing to defend himself or to come off the cross. And at the hands of all of those evil people, failing weak people, a picture of humanity. Actually, you and I were there too. We would have been just like the rest of them. We had no power. We would have either run away or cowered in fear at a distance or denied him like Peter or cried out with the multitudes. And then said Jesus, now that he's hanging on the cross, one of his famous sayings, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Remember one of his teachings? Love your enemies. One of the things he told us to pray, Father, forgive my trespasses, even as those that trespass against me. And guess what? He followed his own teachings, believe it or not. Somebody finally did. There's finally someone here that actually kept their own great teachings, and it was Jesus. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. So the soldiers are still having fun. They gambled over the clothing that he had left. That was all that Jesus had in the world, by the way. The clothing on his back. Can you imagine that? The greatest person ever to live. The Son of God come out of heaven. He goes through life. And at the end of his life, only the clothes on his back is all that he owns. And the soldiers take that and jokingly gamble for it. And the people stood beholding. Now that nothing to do now but watch. The people stood beholding and the rulers also with them derided him saying he saved others let him save himself if he be Christ, the chosen of God. Of course, they're having fun with this. The rulers are. The truth of it is, if he had saved himself, he wouldn't be able to save others. Verse 36. And the soldiers also mocked him, 
coming to him and offering him vinegar and saying, if you be the king of the Jews, save yourself. And uh, he was the king of the Jews. He's the king of the world. I like verse 38. <clears throat> and a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. That was Pilate who had them write that. So sometimes when you see the crucifixion of Christ, you see one little sign with one little phrase. It's actually with three phrases on the real crucifixion, written in three different languages. One reason that Pilate had them put it in three languages, I believe, was so that everyone in Jerusalem would be able to read and know. Some people spoke Greek, some people spoke Hebrew, the Jews, and some pe people spoke Latin, the Romans. And it was written in all three languages, it's also symbolically, because the death of Jesus is for everyone in the world. He is king of the whole world. And so to write it in those three languages was good. But it's also, I think it was Pilate got the last word in. He knew Jesus was innocent, and he knew these terrible leaders of the religion were killing Jesus out of jealousy. And so Pilate wanted to say to them, this is what the Romans do to your king, Jewish people. You're the Jewish people. We're the Romans. And this is what we do to anybody else's kings. So don't you forget that. We're in control here. So he was having the last word against the Jewish leaders. Verse 39 says, And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. You know, there's that song that says, it's based on this theme, he could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free. But instead, he died alone for you and me. That's why he didn't save himself, so that we could be saved. Are you saved? You can be saved if you know Jesus as your Savior. You can pray to Jesus. One of the verses I like about that is Romans 10, 13 that says, And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You can be saved if you'll call upon the name of the Lord Jesus. Remember that. That's a prayer. You can pray to Jesus and ask Him to save you. And because He died on the cross, He can and will save you from your sins. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for what you've recorded for us in the Bible about your death on the cross. We pray that you would help us to remember and help us to appreciate you. Can we do whatever you want us to do, Lord, out of appreciation? Please guide our lives and help us to have that love for you that we should have. We just thank you, Lord, that you suffered that so that we could be forgiven. And we know it was wonderful. And we're, we're, in a way, we're like the other people. Uh, weeping and thinking how horrible it was what happened to you. But we know that you went through that so that you could forgive us and pay the price for sin. That's how terrible sin is, that you had to suffer in such a way so that we could be forgiven, for which we thank you. So we do pray, Lord, that more would be saved, that your spirit would work, that you would touch hearts. We pray that you would use us as witnesses for you, that we could go wherever you want us to go to be witnesses for you, Lord, and to help people to know about you and to see their need of you. In your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen.